He's become the Thunder God, or the Thunder Gods themselves. Familiar Nen. Is Kalua going to be the one to find Palm? How much will she remember? How much will she recognize? <laughs> Gotta prepare the yo yo. Oh, that's cool, as a mirror. This is a horror movie. He breathes a sigh of relief, and then she's behind him. Oh, there she is. And she was a little bit obsessive before. She was an, an ant, a soldier ant. Oh, she did not go peacefully. It's sad. But let's wait. Who knows? I don't know what this means yet. It might be okay. If you're Kuro, do you make your presence known or not? That's a, that's a very interesting first thought. Hide it from Gon is interesting. I mean, it's understandable. Understandable and painful. That Gon is someone that needs to be managed right now. It's a little bit obsessive. Like, I think the natural first thought is about Palm. What does this mean for her? Not what does it mean for Gon? This is maybe not exactly what this is, but what it reminds me of is a relationship where if you have a really domineering partner, you start to see other people and events, not in terms of those things, but in terms of how my partner will react. Because in a very volatile relationship, it often becomes about mitigating damage. Oh, this thing sets them off. This thing sets them off. I have to navigate carefully so that nothing sets them off because that's bad for me. ここで確かめるしかない。ヘロ。俺より前にパームを俺に気づいていたはず。前に言っていた自身の能力。私の能力を使えばよいなかい。オッケー、そっちはインエンハンスバージョンオブオリジナルネン。ダメージはリーダン
使い方を持て余すほどの劇場なら青素直に身を任せればよかったのだわ This is a look Black Widow Dark Demon Goddess こ,こいつやばい She was always dangerous even before she was an ant Wow. Just snapped the yo like it was nothing. Why was that so terrifying? Why does she look like a, a Tekken character? Her moves. Is this really even the ant power though? She was always sort of on the brink. This might just be because she has nothing to color with. Maybe just give her some crayons. This is maybe a counterpoint to what we've seen a lot of in this arc, where there are these beast-like creatures who, through their experiences, through battling with Nen, which, you know, is sort of like a life essence force, graduate to higher conception of life and become sort of less beast-like. Pom has always been on the brink, but this feels like a reversal. It's like, I should have just given in to my impulses from the beginning. God, does it feel good? Why even bother with restraint, which somewhat matches her transformation in a story sense or a physical sense from human to ant. Makula's not using his ultra lightning speed yet. That'll happen. Feels like he just doesn't want to fight her. Oh, she's got Pokemon regions. Where to begin? It's a little bit like sense in free run. He's just not fighting back. You also don't want to kill her. And also we have to rescue Pom. Who's we'll taking a lot of abuse this arc? Following my impulses. Right, right, right. This is better. Does that work? It's honest. Okay, this is very reassuring for both of them. Pom is definitely still in there. In fact, I'm not even sure what the effect of the ant transformation was except upgrading her Nen power, making her slightly more animalistic, though there was always this potential. To Kalua letting go a little bit. This person can't see this thing because they'll snap. It's hard to say outright that I don't agree with it, but my gut senses that that sort of management is wrong. It's especially hard to talk about it in this situation and maybe what I'm gonna say doesn't apply as directly to this because of the stakes, because it's life or death. Maybe avoiding life or death is the most important priority and then everything else can come later. But just trying to look at this as I can relate to it. First of all, you definitely don't wanna fall in the trap of enabling, supporting someone's tyranny. Yes, it's much easier to have everything be copacetic and to get along and to have them love you. You think everything can be peaceful and harmonious. If I only just bend myself in this shape, handle this situation for them, handle that situation for them, everything will be great and we'll love each other forever. It doesn't really work that way. You're likely doing that person a disservice by shielding them from the feedback of traits they'd be better off without. Traits they probably don't want, you know? People generally don't want to be tyrants. They don't want to be terrible. And that might mean losing the relationship. It might be exactly what you fear it is, where the other person will use that as a reason to turn around and attack you and blame you and use whatever leverage they have to win. Because a lot of times what those people have internalized is that relationships are about winning and leverage rather than genuine concern and care. And they will use this as a method of distancing themselves and disappearing, which if that happens, likely means that was on their agenda anyway, and they were just waiting for an opportunity. Though it's really difficult to admit that when you're deeply infatuated or in love with someone or have them mean as much to you as going meets the Kalua. Even in good relationships, there's a, a sympathetic and nice impulse to not want to see people you love have pain, to shield them from painful realities. But I think that falls apart pretty quickly 
under scrutiny. Like if you zoom out, you're restricting them from a truth that was part of their destiny. You've made it so that they have fewer informational tools and so will likely fall into the same mistake again or will get out of it more slowly. In the space of giving advice or trying to help people, trying to get them out of their pain, trying to deal with their emotional issues, there's something that might nag at you in the back of your head where it's like, maybe they shouldn't be helped. You know, maybe the best thing for them is to go through this directly and to have a lot of pain. Very hard to say that. It sounds really cold and uncaring, but maybe they need to go through that pain enough times where they learn. Maybe making them feel better by sort of redrawing the picture is harmful to them. Maybe the pain is there for a very specific, important reason. Maybe that needs to do its job. While I'm saying that I think honesty, brutal honesty is really important, I have to sort of throw a disclaimer in here. Some people will use this as a justification to try to bring people down and attack them. Like they'll be really critical and harsh needlessly. And then their justification will be, well, it's because I care about you. I'm just being honest when the truth is they have some sort of deep-seated resentment for whatever reason, want to bring the other person down. It has to be clean. Like you have to actually really love the person and not be uh, invested in any sort of hierarchy over them or your personal need that is not about them. That's why I use the term letting go and it feels positive to me overall what Clue is saying. Gon is sort of where Gon is and I think the way Clue helps him is being his friend universally no matter what, but not trying to keep him in this box where he's manageable or where he, it feels safe. It's not safe. Gon is like on this emotional journey. He needs to get the full brunt of whatever that is. I'm... Oh. <laughs> oh no. It felt so authentic though. I was totally fooled. Are these just crocodile tears? Did Kluwa have acting training in addition to his electricity, torture, Yo-yo, darts, stealth, politics, training? Seems likely. That's not acting. This is, this is real. Or maybe it's real acting he's drawing from his own true sense of hopelessness for the power, for theater. I broke himself a little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, whew, that's a relief. A lot has happened. It's been very, very long 30 minutes. Smush him. Smush the bee. He gets smushed. Oh, is this going to be one of those things where like a mosquito lands on you and then you punch yourself and the mosquito doesn't die and then you feel really terrible that you got outsmarted by a mosquito and it just sends you into a rage? I've heard that happens to people. Who was it? Right. She did what Nav couldn't. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I thought she went up. She inflicted her own knife wound. That was extreme. Wow, drove her to that. What exactly did they do, though? Okay, so it was deliberate. Oh. Okay. Doesn't seem like it really worked in Palm's case, though. She was clearly affected by that. Anyway, I think typically memories almost have to be associated with an emotion. If there wasn't an emotion, they would be deleted. Memories have a very important function. And if things are important, they'll probably have an emotion. I don't think so. Oh. Poof even gets more lonely. Oh. It's a good thing you did, <laughs> did an experiment first. Poor to miss all of humanity. Wow, she actually managed to land the blow. Given that backstory, this is like the best thing that could have happened to Palm. Thanks, you old hag. Klu would know something about that. Klu pulled her pin. Okay, this is a huge relief. Wow. I agree, but it has to be done right. 
it's still a dangerous situation for them both. Obviously, it's a very complex relationship. It's hard to cover in its full depth. But I mean, this is typically the case that when you love someone, there's parts of you that really loves them unselfishly and wants the best for them. There are parts of you that sees them as a reflection of yourself and things you need to believe and want to believe. Others end up being mirrors for our own self-gratifying image. Like I'm needed, I'm loved, I'm valued, so therefore I'm valuable. I think in a lot of cases that ends up being benign. It causes conflict when the thing you need from the person is no longer what they are or never was what they are. When their growth comes into conflict with what you need from them. Maybe for Kalua, the path is just cementing his own understanding of his own value and beauty, like from himself, because there's plenty to value. The audience definitely sees it. Though like for a long time, I've been annoyed by the fact that it's very difficult to be your own audience in this kind of way. Like as much as we admire Kalua, somebody would probably admire us. It just doesn't naturally feel that way always. But once that's secure enough, you have enough of a foundation or a floor where you can say what you need to say, your pure, honest opinion, unclouded by that kind of need, not steeped in manipulation, not trying to take someone down to keep them in a safe place, not buttering them up so they won't lose it. Just your real conscience without any sort of strings attached, probably without any deep negative emotion. And then you maximize it so that you're doing your best and then you handle yourself and you handle the fallout of that. And you're universally there without stepping over that line where you're suddenly hurting yourself. Or maybe another way to look at it is where it's not a net loss for the both of you. Sometimes it feels like people are... <laughs> bucket-like, where in a particular area, they will just have a hole in their bucket. They will just have some deficiency. It's not circumstantial. It's not an accident. It, it's like repeatedly what they've demonstrated, that they have this thing, this issue that's causing this drain in their life. And then you come along and in this area, at least, you have a full bucket. Your, your bucket is uncompromised by holes. And the instinct is to pour some of your bucket's contents into your friend's bucket. It feels like the right thing to do because it's assistance. But your giving, not only is it a net loss, a net negative for both of you, it's very likely from experience that the other person ends up resenting you for it. Because at least subconsciously, it exposes their weakness. It also makes them start to expect the help. People will come up with all sorts of justifications like, well, you have so much in your bucket. Why don't you pour some into my bucket? They expect you to empty the entire contents of your, your bucket into their bucket, despite the fact that both of your buckets will be empty. And I think a lot of times we do that willingly and knowingly because we expect we'll get something back in return, which is the person's love or everything to be okay again, dissipating this feeling of guilt, but so often none of that happens. It's very difficult to know what that line is, but there definitely is a line where you can give, but it has to be from you having so much abundance that there is no loss. Or it works when the thing you've lost is not as valuable as the thing you've gained. So like, let's say it's a matter of finance and let's say you were just giving your money time and time again to people who just lose all their money. If genuinely, and this is really tough, it has to be genuine, that feeling that you get of giving is greater than the loss of the money. Like you really just don't care about the loss at all. You're happy to be, have nothing. Then it's okay, but that's not re that's not people generally. Actual love can be something that's that abundant. It can be this sort of thing that really doesn't have a limit, right? Like you can continuously give love to someone over and over again and still have just as much of it, maybe even more than when you started. It's not divisible. It's when you step over that line into the point where you're now participating in the negative, you're making someone more reliant instead of less, that things start to get messy. Bottom line, I think Lua comes in and says his piece, does what he can to protect going physically, depending on where he is now with his own level of risk for himself, that he can genuinely give, honestly. Accept no untruths as far as he can see them. Seek to gain nothing that isn't in both of their best interests. Seek you can do gain nothing out of coercing a feeling of attention or love, having no expectations and having the barometer, the guideline for success being, I feel like I did right by this person, and that's it. So is he lesser now? Or do the glitter particles get reabsorbed? They're really turning against each other. Poof can become the king he always dreamed of. He's really sort of separating himself, huh? Okay, the king is still aboard somehow in this fantasy. I feel like he's one step away from wanting to be king himself. He can't accept it yet, but the king has already disappointed him. It feels like it would just take one more push for him to be like, you know what? I hate all of you. You've all betrayed me. Only I can see the true value of kingliness. And off he goes, spiraling into this self-generated circle of loneliness. Speaking of need, speaking of people being a, re a reflection of your own self-image gratification, one by one his siblings become enemies because they're outgrowing him. Or at least that's how I feel about it. This is going to sound so ridiculous and so tragic. Right. But maybe this whole Chimera Ant War arc is a treatise on different kinds of love. You basically have the whole gamut, right? You have Palm's initial infatuation. You have real genuine appreciation of someone through mutual experience, which comes from Yuppie, of all people, and, you know, Knuckle. You have people for whom others are objects of what they themselves most need, which doesn't mean that's always exclusively the case. A lot of the time, it's a mixture of all these things put together. You have the king who's something like loving based on respect, loving based on innocence or purity, ironically having a great motherly nurturing instinct after savagely 
birthing himself from his own mother. You have Gon who's sort of suffering under this ideal of love in this weird backwards way of chasing the love he needs through his own self-image, which is an imagination of the expectations of the people he wants to love him, which gets really weird. You have Pito, it's weird that it's the royal guards that some of the best examples come from, who loves the king for who he is and wants to see him grow. You have Knuckle who loves everyone. You have Akago who loves for having received the gift of being loved or being cared for. It's the full facet all at once.